All right, thank you everybody so much for coming. Uh, welcome to the NOAA Science Seminar, Unique and Ubiquitous, the Role of Deep Sea Methane Seeps to the Ocean, Planet, and Society, which will be a discussion on methane seeps and their role in marine ecosystem services. This seminar series is co-hosted by NOAA Ocean Exploration and the NOAA Central Library, and my name is Logan Klein. I'm a Canals Marine Policy Fellow working at NOAA Ocean Exploration in the Science, Technology, and Outreach and Education Divisions. So I'm really excited to introduce to you our first, or our only, sorry, seminar speaker today, Dr. Andrew Thurber. Dr. Thurber is an Associate Professor of Oceanography and Microbiology at Oregon State University. His current research focuses on how the ocean works, including how the deep sea fits into a functioning planet, as well as methane seeps. Dr. Thurber's project was supported via the NOAA Ocean Exploration Fiscal Year 2019 funding opportunity. So thank you so much, Dr. Thurber, for your time and for choosing to share your really exciting work with us today. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. It's uh, really an honor to be here today and to speak. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about methane seeps. Now, I'm gonna just ruin the punchline of my presentation and talk to you, tell you essentially what I'm gonna tell you today. First and foremost, we benefit a lot from both the deep sea as well as methane seeps. And methane seeps, contrary to many popular uh, sort of views, are not rare. In fact, they're incredibly common. They're really important. For example, they keep our planet inhabitable, as well as they provide many different ecosystem services or societal benefits that are not always recognized. This also is just driven by a fundamental increase of biodiversity as a result of them. And that leads to many different uses, including potential resources such as biopharmaceuticals or biotechnological compounds. In addition, they're unique in many ways and these attributes really require a different modified management approach when we view about ocean ecosystem management on a holistic scale. Now, I also just like to point out, this is sort of my view of the world, and it really is, the world is the deep sea with a few land masses stuck into it. 63 and a half, 64% of the planet is below 200 meters or 600 feet water depth, and that is the deep sea. So when we're talking about deep sea habitats, we're really talking about the world's largest biomes, and our view of it has really changed over time. I think many people, myself included, often think about the deep sea as this image mud, maybe a few fish, maybe a few different kinds of invertebrates, but really most of the deep sea is this mass of mud, which isn't very exciting unless you think about the microbiome of it, and that is, but that's not what today's talk about. But what we're increasingly finding out is that the deep sea is a incredible diversity of different habitats. One of the ones that are ubiquitous across the coastal oceans are methane seep habitats. Now, they do a variety of different things that makes them unique, and one of those is that they're not fueled directly from the sunlight. Instead, they're fueled by chemosynthesis as a result of methane being released from vast subsurface reservoirs coming up, interacting with a variety of different microbes that fuel product uh, production, the fixation of CO2 into biomass, either through symbionts or non-symbiont sources, and that not only provides a food source, but it also provides a different habitat where things like these little towers that you're seeing in front of you, which are egg cases of, uh, of um, snails, use them to lay their eggs, even though those snails are not unique to methane seep ecosystems. So they modify the fundamental structure of the deep sea. In addition to that, we used to think that methane seeps were rare. They weren't discovered until 1984, but since then our understanding of their distribution is growing in leaps and bounds. Just in a, as a recent example, on the left of the screen here, you'll see that there's a, a map of pretty much all of the methane seeps we knew about until 2010 on the Cascadia margin. That's Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Southern British Columbia, and it's area where the most of my talk today will be focused. So we knew about five or maybe 10. Colleagues at University of Washington and PMEL on the coast here um, have found youth through some different analytical techniques. That number is not 10, but it's at least 3,500 different methane seeps. And one of the challenges we have with methane seeps is actually that we want to study the methane seeps in a contrast to other environments that are non-methane seeps. And frequently, if we're in a submersible or using a remote operated vehicle and we're trying to get away from a methane seep so we can study the quote background environment, 
we run into another methane seep. These are ubiquitous and incredibly common habitats, and that also makes us shift our approach and our want to understand their role in the ecosystem, because there's not five of them, there's 3,500, and it means that they can have a much, much greater role in the overall ocean ecosystem, which is a goal of research. Now, this is a few different examples of how they can impact within the ocean. They can uh, be sources of increased predation. They can be a source of productivity. They can sort of create a sphere of influence, not just epicenters, but spheres that overlap in a variety of different ways. And that's going to be one of our main themes that I'm going to talk about today. So kind of big questions, what is the influence of seeps on the ocean and society? And we have a few challenges associated with that. One, until recently, we've really only studied a handful of seeps. There's one off the coast of Oregon, Hydrate Ridge, one of the best studied ecosystems of this type globally, but it's only one. In addition, we always focus on the seeps. They're really cool, but they're also in this framework of an ocean ecosystem. And so if we wanna know what the, how the ocean functions, we need to understand them within that context. And finally, they're very dynamic and they change over time. So each one of these can impact our understanding of these habitats in the overall ocean. Now, communication of different habitats is really critical to society so they know why they're funding research and also appreciate that as management decisions are very much impacting seep habitats. Many of these habitats occur in areas where management is active, both fisheries, mineral resource, and others. And so we put out a video in the Oceans Today portal, which highlights many of this. And this was working with some colleagues here at Oregon State University, as well as the NOAA team. And one of the main goals is to identify how things like microbes, which eat methane, being released from vast subsurface reservoirs, and you can see that methane bubbling out here, lead to these different ecosystems. Methane seeps result from dead organic matter, mostly phytoplankton, but fish is a good example, that rots over time in the subsurface, leads to methane buildup, and then that not only creates a food source on the seafloor, but also it as a byproduct ends up even creating rocks and shifting the overall function of the habitat, and those rocks are even storage areas of carbon dioxide, which can mitigate some of our impact on the global ecosystem through human activities. So this is just a minute of the Ocean Today portal. I'd encourage you to go look at it because it summarizes much of the work I'll talk about today. But the point of this is really to identify and communicate the role of methane seeps in ocean ecosystems. One of the reasons we study methane is because methane is a very important and potent greenhouse gas. Depending on what paper you read, it's somewhere between 25 and 35 times as effective at warming our atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And unlike carbon dioxide, we don't know why it's going up into the atmosphere, even though it's increased about 150% since pre-industrial times. There are vast quantities of methane in the oceans stored deep in the subsurface and sometimes quite shallowly. And for a number, it's about 1,800 gigatons carbon of methane. And if you think about the amount of methane, if it was released into the atmosphere, we would very rapidly impact our climate now and in the future. This uh, image, I really like this image for a couple of reasons, one of which is on the left-hand side of the screen. You see how much of that methane is stored. It's in a methane clathrate ice. It's a molecule of methane that's trapped as a result of pressure and temperature in an ice framework by water. That's a really interesting chemical reaction. But one of the challenges is this stable form of hydrate is driven by temperature and pressure and by warming the oceans, we're just stabling, just destabilizing the system on a variety of different scales. We don't know how that's gonna play out. It's an important research question, but what we do know is that we are shifting the fundamental driving factors of methane seepage, and you'll see how that plays a role later. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the microbes. I'm not gonna delve in too much, but what's really important to think about is we have this, these vast quantities of methane, potent greenhouse gas being released. And the first thing that happens is they come in contract with these incredible microbes working together. It's a form of symbiosis called syntrophy or cross-feeding. And what happens is that one microbe, an archaea, takes methane, one microbe, usually a delta proteobacteria, takes sulfate, they each do a half chemical reaction, they share electrons, and as a result of that, 
they eat 70 to 90 percent of the methane before it even makes it up into the areas of our, our ocean that have oxygen. This is the most important microbially mediated methane sink on our planet and it really keeps most of the methane out of the water and definitely out of the atmosphere. They're called anemies, uh, and I kind of think of them as the M&Ms of the deep sea because you have this candy coating of bacteria with the chocolate center of archaea, and it really allows our environment to be able to persist, our habitat and our globe to be inhabitable. Absolutely critical. Any methane that escapes from that comes in contact with other microbes. There's a variety of different kinds, but these are aerobic methanotrophs, methane-eating microbes, and they're sort of more normal microbes that take methane, mix it with oxygen, use that as a source of chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis to take CO2, and turn it into biomass. These processes are those that fuel methane seed ecosystems. Together, we call them the methane filter. And what that means is that the methane is being filtered out of the sediment and out of the water before it can get into the atmosphere. And it's absolutely critical to keeping our planet as a place we can live. So there's a lot of impact just from that, but I'm gonna talk about a few other uh, impacts of methane seeps on our coastal oceans. I'm then gonna talk about how not all seeps are the same. And this is really fueled by the impact of uh, exploration where we can start to quantify this. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how seeps have a sphere of influence beyond just the seep themselves. Seeps are very diverse in their resources. There's a variety of different ways to communicate this. One of those is through ecosystem service frameworks, which allows one to communicate to managers and others about why one should value an ecosystem. And so if management decisions are needed to be made, which is a commonality, even in the deep sea, they can essentially weigh the variable benefits and risks. Now there's a variety of different frameworks that have used and I've actually taken one and renamed it because what we really want to understand from an environment is what are the different benefits, the material items that we can get from that. An example of that's oil and gas or um, fisheries, nutrition, novel genes, biopharmaceutical, biotechnological compounds. Now at the same time, we also really need a functioning planet. And so that's things like the methane oxidation that I just talked about, or methane consumption, removing methane before it can get to the atmosphere, energy production, creating food sources, in addition to waste absorption, detoxification. But that's only really a subset of the societal benefits of any habitat. Methane seeps are no different. And in fact, they're incredibly important in education, scientific discoveries, as well as in some cases, tourism. So when we talk about methane seeps and we know that they're now incredibly abundant in their chemosynthetically fueled habitats, we can calculate how important they can be. We did some back of the envelope calculations and came up to globally, methane seeps release about seven to 10% of all of the energy that goes into the deep sea. So these are not unique rare habitats. They're actually so abundant that it is a significant amount of energy balancing that that's coming from the sun to fuel deep sea habitats globally. Now, uh, this is some imagery that we um, were collected by Ocean Network Canada. They sent us this video. And what you're seeing here is tanner crabs. And these are sometimes sold, or they are sold as snow crab, the deep snow crab legs. And what you can see is they're standing in this area with lots and lots of bubbles. It's being lifted off the seafloor and dropped on its head. And the reason why that's happening is because methane hydrate, that ice is forming underneath the crab, picking it off the seafloor, and then is being released and dumping it on its head. Now, the reason why this was really important is not only is what I would think is a fairly entertaining video, but also this is an example of a commercial species actively visually feeding at a methane seep. What we did to identify the potential role of this was a variety of different biomarker approaches, including stable isotopes, fatty acids. And what we ended up finding to be the most powerful to identify that these uh, crabs are actually getting energy from methane seeps is by looking at the microbes that were present in the guts. On the right-hand side of the plot, I'm showing you three different crabs. Those fit colors are the abundant of total kinds of archaea that were present within the gut, one of the domains of microbes. Those that are labeled ANME are unique to methane seep ecosystems. And you can see that in certain cases, for example, crab number seven, 100% of the archaea that were present within its gut were actually from methane seep taxa, so or taxa only found at methane seeps. 
So this is the first example of a commercially harvested species getting energy from methane seep habitats. There was a really unique distribution of the crabs and we hypothesized that this might be a food subsidy that's used seasonally for these taxa, although we don't really know if that's the case. Future research may look into that. But in any case, it provides an example of food production making it all the way potentially to the human table. I also would like to point out that these are not toxic crabs. There's nothing against eating these crabs. Uh, it's just an example of really the energy coming from the seafloor to our plates. Another great example are fisheries. Uh, fisheries in the deep sea are very active, especially for ground fish. And uh, I'll just use an example I'm most familiar with, which is off Oregon. Uh, there's many different fish species harvested in the deep sea. Many of these are ground fish. It's a 14.3 plus million dollar industry. And using some older data ending in 2010, more than 65% of those are actually caught in the deep sea. This is a heavily regulated industry uh, and the regulations are revisited on a five to 10 year scales. We're increasingly able to understand the distribution of these taxa as a result of exploration, collaborations with many scientists, and we started to find there are certain taxa that are found in increased abundance at methane seeps, including thorny heads, maybe uh, in certain cases Dover sole. But every once in a while when we're exploring the deep sea, what we find is completely unexpected views. And this is one example of that. These are sable fish or black cod. This is an incredibly important fishery off the coast of Oregon. And this is a massive amount of them that were just covering this methane seep habitat. Uh, this is a video collected by the Ocean Exploration Trust with the EV Nautilus. And essentially it went on for three to four hours. There were so many fish, the tasks planned for the dives weren't able to be accomplished because the fish were in the way. But this is a huge aggregation that co-occurred with the methane seep environment. As a result of the observations, including such as this, uh, the Regional Fisheries Management Council, the Pacific Fishery Management Council, has identified methane seeps as essential fish habitat, so their distribution can be considered when they're making management decisions. So even though they're the deep sea, they're increasingly being appreciated for their role, including in things like provisioning services or material benefits to society. So seeps in a coastal ocean and what we get from them, these are abundant habitats. They fuel the habitats, including all the way up to people. And they're really important for greenhouse gas cycling with a variety of different exciting ways that they may um, impact society moving forward. Now seeps are not all the same, but we don't really know that. And so this next few slides, I'm gonna talk about how there's a huge diversity among seeps, between seeps, and if we've only studied one seep, we have not studied seeps along the margin. Said another way, biodiversity matters, and is specifically to a variety of different taxa or different re reasons, ecosystem services, that biodiversity can be more or less important. And a key example of that is novel genes, the potential for biopharmaceutical biodiscoveries, as well as just understanding what is the correct scale of management if we're thinking about MPAs or protecting different deep sea habitats. Understanding the scale of biodiversity is critical to many scientific pursuits and management reasons. So I mentioned that Hybrid Ridge is right off the coast of Oregon. I'd say this is probably one of the best studied methane seeps on the planet. Uh, it is a, a wonderful area to really delve in and understand exactly how these different taxa and different microbial processes function tied into the geo landscape that's present there, but it's only one. And so what we wanted to do is partnering, partnering with uh, Ocean Exploration Trust, Trust, Ocean Network Canada, as well as Ocean Exploration uh, NOAA, we've essentially been trying to collect samples from as many different methane seeps along the coast, now that we know that there's 3,500, so we can see what is the scale of biodiversity. And I'll just talk about uh, a few different seeps that we studied initially, and then I'll expand this up over time. As you can see, we have samples, including from uh, Clayoquot Slope, Barclay Canyon Seep in Canada, down to Juan de Fuca, all the way down to Klamath Knoll, uh, which is just north, or just about on the Oregon-California border. Here's a visual representation, and what you'll see is that all of the seeps look really different from each other. There's not one sort of common habitat. You can see there's a lot of microbial mats, those white mats, which are, tax, are microbes that eat the hydrogen sulfide that's produced as the byproduct of eating methane. You have large tube worm bushes. These only seem to occur 
deeper than 1,000 meters water depth or 3,000 feet. And you can see clams in a variety of different taxa that have symbionts present within them. Here's a close-up of the clams. But each one of these seeps, we essentially would say, well, this is what it's going to look like. Each one of them looked quite a bit different. And that's starting to lead to the fact that we're finding many different taxa to be present and the scale and distribution really does matter. The first thing we wanted to do is say, well, how, how different are they? And one of the things we do is we look at the microbial communities. This is a multidimensional scaling plot. The important thing to know is that each one of these points represents a microbial community from a methane seep or from a non-methane seep habitat in the deep sea off the coast of Oregon, California, Washington, and British Columbia. And I want you to see essentially three different groupings, which I've circled. These are significantly different microbial groupings. And each point that's closer to each other is more similar than points farther across. The circles are significantly different microbial communities. And what you can see is that there's non-seep habitats, and then there's seep habitats separating the Canadian methane seeps from Oregon, Northern California seeps. So there's a regional biogeography to these habitats, which we've been trying to better understand. Among the most perplexing of these patterns was if we go just from north to south and we plot the total biodiversity or species richness of microbes, these are bacteria in archaea, we see a linear trend of there's reduced biodiversity with decreasing latitude as you go down to this calamethanol more southerly site. So there's clear spatial patterns that we're trying to disentangle. Now these patterns are really interesting in many different ways. Uh, one of those is this is the ocean is a, just a marvelous mix of different habitats, both within the water column as well as the seafloor. Off the coast here, we have an area of very low oxygen or an oxygen minimum zone that permeates from about five to 600 meters down to a thousand meters. And that's imprinting on the margin and overlapping on these areas that have active areas of methane seepage. In addition, there's a change with depth, and depth has a variety of different impacts, especially as one gets deeper than 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet, shifting the overall physiology of microbes and animals the same. And so what we've been trying to do is come up with a holistic understanding using microbes and animals together to be able to explain what drives biodiversity along the margin. Now, these are just some spatial uh, views of uh, what exactly the different habitats look like. We go from shallow 150 to 200 meters right at that upper edge of the deep sea where we tend to have these little pockets of microbial mats. Going deeper, we tend to have expansive clam beds. These areas still have oxygen present. And then when you get into the oxygen minimum zone, you have this real lack of um, animal fauna, although you still get many different microbes. And then below that is where you have large tube worms, um, you have gastropod egg cases, as well as a variety of different taxa. And so what we've tried to do is come up with a holistic view so we can inform what people should expect one air in a different area, driven not only by the region, the oceanography, the surface productivity, the total photosynthetic input, as well as area things like seepage, but also how that may change with time. Now that's, um, this is essentially what we've done here. On the right-hand side, you can see sort of those data that fueled this from the microbiome perspective, where you have a variety of different drivers, but we've tried to make this into something that people can use in a more straightforward way. First, we have these shallow areas where you have lots of energy from the sun getting deposited in these shallow, less than 200 meter sites. As you go deeper, you get to this area where that methane hydrate, that ice, is just barely stable. And so you tend to be at that feathered edge of hydrate stability, which is also the epicenter of where a warming ocean can change these environments. These areas, we have microbial communities that are similar to deeper communities. There's oxygen in the water column. We start to have lots of clams. We then get deeper and deeper into this oxygen minimum no zone. Very few large taxa are present mostly microbial communities until we get deeper down where we get to these late secessional stages, these stages that have been very present and pertinent for a long time that have shaped the ecosystem, led to rocks being developed, led to two worms being present. And essentially, uh, these are the sort of classical methane seep habitats. But I'll say when we embarked upon this work, we really hadn't spent much time discovering these. And in fact, tube worm bushes themselves were almost unknown from this region because we hadn't explored those deeper depths. 
So we're still sort of scratching the surface on biodiversity, but we're really trying to understand it in a holistic framework for a variety of reasons. Now, I've been increasingly interested in fungal communities, and the reason is, is because fungi are the movers and the shakers in addition to the microbial communities. They're able to break down carbon, take CO2 that's been trapped in these really ugly carbon molecules, release it, and so there can be important in remineralizing or making other kinds of buried compounds now available either for other animals or microbes to eat or release that SCO2 back into the water column, impacting our carbon legacy. So my student uh, who uh, defended her master's thesis, I guess that was last year, Leela Arter Bellucci, um, decided to look at the fungal communities at methane seeps. And this was a challenging project because more than 50% of the taxa that counted as fungal communities were completely unknown to science, even at the phylum level. So we are uh, just, again, scratching the dis absolute surface of diversity for fungal communities, even though we know in other habitats, especially freshwater habitats and forest habitats, that these are absolutely critical components of microbial communities, animal communities, and ecosystems, and yet more than 50%, we don't even know what phylum they belong to when we look in the deep sea. Much like the microbial communities, they also have regional variation in biodiversity. Again, this is a multidimensional scaling plot. Each one of these points represents a sample and thousands of different fungi. And the circles represent significantly different grouping. Uh, this was, these were sampled at uh, four different methane seep habitats, as well as off seeps. Regional groupings, regional latitudinal variation seems to be the most important in structuring these communities. So there's, when we're thinking about MPAs, thinking about how to manage our marine resources, this regional variation becomes increasingly important. So I hope from this I've shown you that seeps are not all the same. There's strong regional variations, not only in the microbes, but also in the animals with depth, uh, and also including fungal communities, which is a really new and exciting avenue of research. Um, so in other words, a seep is not just a seep. But we've been studying the seeps themselves. So let's talk about how they fit into the ocean ecosystem. So I'm gonna talk about two. These are two of my favorite seeps. I like them because they're not very far apart from each other. They're at the exact same water depth at about a thousand meters. And what we're looking at here is one we call M and Mule. This is a, essentially the top of a seamount that's been paved over. These rocks are formed as the byproduct of microbes eating methane. It leads to the precipitation of carbonate within the sediment that if it goes on for thousands or millions of years, you can end up with these habitats, cold water corals, uh, sponges can settle on them. In each one of these little white pockets, you can see some cnidarians there and some uh, thorny head uh, fish uh, take advantage of this habitat to shift the overall function. So we like to consider this an old sea. How old is it? We don't know, but things more on the thousands to millions of years. Really not far away from it was one of the largest areas that's just do dominated by microbes I've ever seen. It was a spherical microbial mat, which is an area that has lots of methane being released from it. That was 60 meters in diameter. It was a giant circle. This is not that 60 meter seat. This is just a little uh, offshoot to the side. Really remarkable. And what this allowed us to do is actually study those areas and then look at how it impacts the environment to the side. Milo Cummings, who was a graduate student in my lab, wanted to uh, look at the microbial communities within the sediment, both close and off the seep. And so we have these two seep, what we like to call the young seep, that big microbial mat with no real rock deposit, which takes time to build up, and then the old seep underneath. And going from the seep on the right-hand side to the um, non-seep, 150 meters off the seep to the left-hand side, and going from blue to red, we have an increase in biodiversity, microbial diversity, and that's as a function of sediment depth, which is what the y-axis is on each one of these plots. Somewhat surprisingly, there was actually a sort of an ecotone or a maximum area of diversity five meters off of the seep, not at the seep itself, which indicates that even within the sediment, not even thinking about the water, but even within the sediment, we have this area where it's having an expansive impact on the sediment community going out farther and farther. If you look at M and Mule, the lower one, you also see that there's a peak in biodiversity as you go off seep again. So there may be an impact of the seep even 50 meters off of the seep within the sediment community. So they have an expanded 
impact. It's not just the seat themselves. Now, one of the reasons we care about biodiversity, there's many reasons, but one of them is that biodiversity translates into a variety of different potential human uses. These have many names. Uh, marine genetic resources is an often used one, especially at the international scale. Biopharmaceutical and biotechnological compounds is another one of those. And then they used to be traditionally called natural products. In many ways, these are the same way to talk about compounds that can be used for clinical, medicinal, or industrial use. Increasingly, natural products can be incredibly important for solving different societal illnesses, and 50% of cancer treatments are currently uh, come from marine natural, or sorry, natural products. Marine natural products is an area where we're finding many new different compounds. If you look at just those deeper than 50 meters, there haven't been a lot of research there, but more than 600 MGRs of potential societal use have been found there and 75% of those have collected from deep sea have been shown to be bioactive in some way or another. In other words, there's a real epicenter and opportunity to understand how this biodiversity may impact uh, future society. I also just wanna bring up this exact same plot again because fungal communities uh, and fungal associated communities are real epicenters of natural products discovery. So if you think about unknown potential discovery of natural products or biopharmaceutical compounds, and you look at a plot where more than 50% of the taxa are completely known, unknown at the phylum level, such a great opportunity to advance that field of research. So we worked with uh, uh, Dr. Carrie McPhail here at Oregon State University, who have two amazing colleagues, uh, George Nauhaus, who's a postdoctoral scholar, and this was really led by Margaret Reddick, who's a PhD student in Carrie's lab. And in concert with all of our microbial studies, they looked for potential biopharmaceutical and biotechnological compounds using some really amazing uh, next generation computing and bioanalytical techniques. Uh, and I'm just gonna, they found thousands and thousands. I just wanted to mention two, uh, this uh, meroterpenoid uh, on the left, as well as this lipopolypeptide. The one on the left has many different, is closely associated with many different antimicrobial roles. The one on the right is a potential insecticidal compound. And what these figures are showing is not only a closely related um, identi identity, uh, and this is the beginning of many years of work to actually take this to see if there's a, a good use, but each one of these different nodes on this network is identifying a structurally unique compound that is related to the source compound. And the coloration of those nodes is a different habitat that's present within the deep sea that were collected as part of our research project, looking at the sphere of influence, trying to characterize that biodiversity. And this is translating it to the molecular diversity of potentially useful compounds. So these are um, estimated um, compound structures. So there's again, a lot more research, but it just hopefully what's your appetite for what some of the possibility of this line of research within these seep habitats. Now, taking the same plot of biodiversity that Milo Cummings present or put together, and that's in a paper that's out in Pure J right now, uh, Margaret then took and mapped on top of that the diversity of different compounds of um, that were present within the, the, the sediment. You can think about these as metabolomics or different ways that microbes communicate, but really how microbes fight with each other as well. And when you find two microbes trying to outcompete and fight with each other, that's really when you end up with these small molecules that might turn out to be very effective at keeping those uh, microbes from being effective in other areas. So what she did, which I think is really interesting, is she took different a priori groupings, so not using any sort of characterization other than the actual structure of the microbial community, and use that to identify samples that were significantly not different from each other, and each one of those is color-coded going down the sediment core, and those are shown on the right-hand side of each one of these two-column pairs. And then she did the exact same thing with the compounds from um, the essentially the metabolome or the, the potential uh, marine genetic resources, natural products, biopharmaceutical compounds. And what you can see is that the groupings, the, the bold square boxes, each one of those is significantly unique um, group of both microbe or, bio, or um, molecular compounds as identified through liquid chromatography, candid mass spectrometry. You see that the biodiversity of the microbes 
imprints very heavily and specifically on the bio or the diversity of the different compounds. So in other words, this is just a way to link potential biopharmaceutical discovery with the microbial community. And again, highlights how this biodiversity created by seeps or the shifted microbial community really has direct impact on the potential discovery of novel biopharmaceutical compounds. Again, a lot of this uh, discovery using the compounds is in its infancy. It's a, it's a huge amount of work, but I think this is a strong reason to continue to try to use this to identify what compounds may be able to be used to solve future societal ills. Whereas that's really uh, an exciting opportunity, there's many other uses that are posed for deep sea habitats. Methane is a potential source for natural gas. It's currently not bio or economically viable. However, it's been discussed. There are maps of methane uh, in hydrate resources off the coast. Um, the other potential source of mining or use, more sort of specific use, is looking for rare earth elements or other elements within the seafloor. And what this is showing is that if we look at the distance from seep, these were taken at the exact same place as the previous uh, microbial communities that I talked about. We can see for uh, four different rare earth elements, there's actually an increased abundance within the sediment at these methane seep habitats. Now, rare earth elements are incredibly geopolitical landscape discussion that is uh, well beyond the scope of this current presentation. But what's really important is for a uh, technological advances, many of them are absolutely critical. They're not good sources in many places on land. And so there's a real drive to find resources that can be used at a concentration where they are able to be used by industry. And as we can see, methane seeps are one area where we might actually have an increase, but that raises a whole nother scheme of management questions as to what we as a society may choose to do with this information. So uh, in fact, some of those, um, some of the rare earth elements were more than 30% enriched in seep sediments. On a much more exciting note, rather than mining and specific use of the environment, methane seeps provide a whole lot of crazy biodiversity in the animal realm and animal form. And this can be used in many ways. One of the ways is through inspiration for art. I am fortunate and privileged to get to work with Lily Simonson, who's an artist based in Berkeley, California, who got completely enamored with uh, methane seep habitats as the result of the discovery of Yeti crabs. Uh, she's done an entire series of Yeti crabs, but increasingly she's been interested in microbial communities and seeps in general. And this is a way to again, translate why we do exploration, why we do science, to people in a way that a scientist like myself will never be capable of doing. And so uh, art is one of the real societal benefits from deep sea habitats and methane seep habitats as well. There's also many different ways to try to use these discoveries and these explorations to get people excited about science and understand the many different career paths or reason why we do that. And some of the uh, reasons we do that is to be able to explain people why they should care about these habitats. So when they're making decisions, if they're asked if they need to decide about rare earth element mining, they have a foundation of knowledge. And so much of that is just trying to communicate um, why we study these habitats. This is a uh, short blip of a, a poster that we put together to try to communicate to Oregon residents why they should uh, be concerned or at least informed about management of deep sea habitats. Uh, and this was a really enlightening experience because we saw people from the entire political spectrum all coming together and saying, we really value these habitats. In some cases, it's biopharmaceutical compounds. In some cases, it's fisheries. But by creating an informed populace, it allows them to really um, realize why we are doing what we're doing. I also like to say it's a hook for education. One of my most enjoyable experiences were, was we were running these focus groups and we had this document to try to communicate the different values. And one of the people actually said, can I bring this uh, document home because I want to share it with my family. We actually ran surveys uh, months after we did it. And what was most surprising is most of the people actually from a museum exhibit we displayed, most of the people not only remembered something from the exhibit, a majority of them had actually told somebody else about how amazing the deep sea is uh, and methane seeps were well, were well uh, prominent in that discussion. So it's not hard to get people excited about these environments if given the opportunity. And sometimes it's really a communication, whether that be working with social scientists to use the right words or with artists to spark that interest. And, you know, I love to talk to K through 12 schools and 
uh, it is not hard to get elementary and high school students really excited about these environments if given the opportunity to do so. So um, there's a variety of sphere of influence. Some of that's localized five meters off, different biodiversity, biodiversity that can translate into different biopharmaceutical compounds. Sometimes it's implications to society. I talked about crabs that eat at methane seeps, massive aggregations of sablefish, but also that sphere of influence expands all the way up to coastal and non-coastal communities, both within the US and globally, because they can be that way, that hook to get one into science, that hook to get one into caring about environment management, or at least just having informed decisions as we're all asked to make decisions as to what uses we have for our natural resources. So seeps have a sphere of influence far beyond that little maybe not so little uh, role on the, on the seafloor. Now, the world is changing. The world is changing in many ways. I think this is not a new topic. We're warming our oceans, atmosphere, driving, driving that by CO2, and also having this unexplained reason why we're having increased methane within the atmosphere. Methane seeps are a really interesting nexus of this, in part because they are going to be changing and they're an environment that changes in a unique way. Now, one of the reasons why they're unique is that things that seeps go slowly. Those tube worms that I showed images of, they last, they grow for hundreds of years. They're not, they don't grow quickly. They grow, they take a long time, much like other deep sea habitats. Some of the more interesting taxa that grow very slowly are those anaerobic methane oxidizing symbiotic relationship between that archaea and the bacteria. Most microbes, they can, they can double their cells in about 12 hours, 24 hours is a fairly slow microbe. These particular taxa, and these are the taxa that are responsible for keeping most of the methane out of the atmosphere globally, they double on six to seven months. If we take, starting with one or two in the sediment, adding methane and seeing how long until they can reach what we consider a standing stock of those communities, we're talking about a decade and we're changing the environment and the fuel. And so it begs the question, how long will it take these microbial communities to actually respond to any sort of perturbation on the seafloor? For example, warming the, the um, destabilizing those methane hydrate reserves. Well, um, luck shined upon us uh, and we actually found an area of methane seepage. This is shallow, but it's in the Antarctic and uh, it's a great analog for the deep sea. We know that it turned on in 2011, and what I'm going to show you is that it's taken more than 10 years for this microbial community to become adapted. This is a picture of the habitat. It's shallow. It, I think it's beautiful. It's underneath a frozen ocean. You can see a crack in the ice, and these white microbial mats are exactly like the white microbial mats that I showed you from off the coast of the uh, Oregon, Washington, Northern California, British Columbia, globally. And it was exciting because it's dove on since 1967. It formed, this seat just popped out of nowhere in 2011. And so we've been able to study how the microbial community changes over time. And, it'll, and it's the only place on the planet that we can do this. And we think it's gonna be a window into understanding our future um, climate trajectory and the role of methane in it. Here's another multidimensional scaling plot. This one's really nice and straightforward. Essentially, we have control sites of the microbial community, not at the seep. After one year of seepage, we had the microbial community start to change. After five years of seepage, it continued to change. We have new samples from 10 years after the seepage. And what this is supposed to show is that it's taking essentially five to 10 years for the microbial community to adapt. That's not in any climate models. And even if we look at the amount of methane coming out of the seafloor, 10 years after seepage began, it's still not limiting that methane and we do not have an established sediment filter. Now this is research that went on in the Antarctic. However, there's real pertinence off the coast of anywhere where there's methane hydrates and that is the US Eastern, Western and Gulf of Mexico seaboard because all of a sudden we might have a lag time where it takes a while for the biological mitigation of methane release to become established to a point where it's not gonna be impacting these large critical greenhouse gas cycles. So what I hope that you took out of today is that seeps are very variable. They're areas where they're unique biodiversity and that biodiversity has a footprint that expands out. It impacts a variety of different aspects where NOAA touches on, global management touches on, be they fisheries, resource extraction, and those have specific roles for economic futures, 
be that drug discovery or different sort of uh, extractive processes. All this is really possible driven by exploration. It allows us to look not at one site, but how variable those sites are across an area spanning from the Canadian border or just beyond, uh, all the way down to the um, essentially anywhere we can get access to. I'll say the Canadian port samples were all taken by Canada. They sent us to us as part of a different project, but it's great to get these latitudinal gradients driven by international collaboration as well. This exploration is critical to try to understand how the ocean works, how variable it is, and essentially, hopefully, inform some increased management. I have a colleague that calls the coastal ocean peopled seascapes because there are so many people and uses of our coastal ocean. The deep sea and methane seeps are absolutely part of that. We have fishing down well below the depths of uh, that methane seeps st start to become abundant, including those that have long lived species. And there's many ways that this directly impacts people in a plethora of ways. I think there's been some incredibly visionary approaches to consider the distribution when we're making management decisions of methane seeps off our coast. But as you can see, this is a multifaceted area that exploration allows us to understand what questions we need to ask moving forward, especially as we start to understand that what we thought based on certain sites does not apply to margins and instead spatial variability, temporal variability, successional patterns, and shifting fundamental drivers, including ocean temperature, is really challenging our ability to understand our future oceans because we don't understand our oceans now. With that, I'd uh, like to wrap up my science talk. Um, I'd like to thank uh, many colleagues, collaborators, students, wonderful people to work with. Uh, this is just a huge number of cruises over years led by colleagues and collaboration internationally, nationally, much of it funded by NOAA in a variety of different pathways. And I thought for the end, I'd just show this video. This was put together by Katie Dar, who was a grad student in my lab and was a previous Knauss fellow, talking about how uh, Oregon's deep sea directly impacts um, Oregon residents, although it can be widely applied to many different systems. I'd also like to end this by um, pointing out that I've talked about the Cascadia margin off the coast of Oregon, Washington, Northern California. This tale is not unique to this part of the globe. It's not unique to this part of the environment of the US. The Eastern seaboard has a plethora, a massive amount of methane seeps where many of these same exploration questions can are increasingly being tasked to be able to understood so we understand the scale of biodiversity and the role of these habitats in our ocean environment. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Thurber, so much. Uh, you've definitely opened my eyes to methane seeps and appreciate that. Um, so audience, we have about 12 minutes to take your questions uh, and I would love to, to see them. So go ahead and type them into the questions chat box. It's located in the control panel, um, probably on the right side of your computer. And I'm gonna read those questions to Dr. Thurber. And uh, just as a reminder, if you showed, showed up a little bit late, um, I'm gonna put the link to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel into the chat in a moment. Uh, please encourage people that were not able to make it today to watch this recording. This is a really interesting topic and I think a lot of people would be interested in it. So we did get our first question while you were speaking. Uh, this first question asks, what impact would offshore wind energy affect the ocean circularity mechanism? Hmm. So offshore wind is a really hot topic right now, uh, and it has many different implications. The Just speaking from seeps, which is what I'll do, uh, it really matters where they are uh, and the way that they impact the seafloor habitats and whether or not the seafloor has been mapped for what seeps are present. Um, you know, the, the we, it's easy to dismiss renewables uh, or embrace renewables for energy and just having an informed management as to know what habitats you're impacting and how is really criti critical. Uh, offshore wind has significant infrastructure that goes on the seafloor. I would personally uh, advocate for not putting those on top of a methane seep that has 100 to 1000 year old organisms on it. Um, but there's many different uh, pieces of information that needs to go into scoping the distribution of where offshore wind is the correct place to be used. 
and the many different users of those different resources, including recreation, commercial, uh, fishing communities, as well as um, making sure that the impacts of all of the different habitats on the seafloor are considered when that decision is made. Thank you. This next question asks, regarding spatial variation between SEEP's WRT regional and latitudinal factors, can you speak to whether you have observed or whether you think deep sea SEEP species at these different sites would have different physiologies, chemical compositions, for example, shells, or behavior? Yeah, so that's a, another great question, and it's one we've really struggled with. Uh, in part because we don't find a real clear driver of the latitudinal gradients um, that we would expect. Uh, we would expect we expect it to be productivity or oxygen, uh, and without knowing the underly underlying drivers, it's hard to point out the physiological differences of that. Some of the other research we've done has tried to look at the composition of symbionts present within some of the chemosynthetic organisms, and we have started to see that there is some regional variation either with sharing symbionts or not, uh, and that is a way to start to look at the physiology of that. Um, I'd say right now we're really trying to understand it from an energy in, energy out, and because energy is so important in these habitats, and by that I mean the amount of chemosynthetic fixation versus sunlight fueled fixation photosynthesis, um, each one of those can lead to differential physiology. We are in an incredibly exciting uh, time though, able to start looking at genome and transcriptome or RNA translation of DNA to know what microbes are actually doing. Uh, and microbes, be they um, bacteria, archaea, or also organisms, where we can start tease apart the physiological role of latitudinal gradients by actually seeing what things are doing rather than just sort of coarse approaches as who's there or who's not there. Because who's there only uh, is one picture of it. Physiology can allow distributions of the same taxa to use very different sort of approaches in areas that have low oxygen, high oxygen, different depths, um, all of those patterns. And so the physiology definitely imprints over that. And I'm excited to be at a spot where we can start to tease that apart, but we have not yet been successful at that. Thank you. Um, while we wait for our next question, I'm gonna invite Logan to come back and tell us a little bit about our, our next ocean exploration event. Hi, sure. So um, thank you so much for sharing your research with us, Dr. Thurber, and hopefully everybody can continue to add questions into the chat. but. Um, I wanted to let people know that the next NOAA Ocean Exploration Seminar is co-hosted co with the Central Library is going to be on August 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and should feature doctors Lisa Levin and Paul Jensen. And they're going to speak about their work on the biopharmaceutical potential of benthic communities across mineral rich biomes off of Southern California. So if you're hoping to come into that, uh, mark your calendars and we'll have some information out soon. Have we gotten any other questions? Because I have some uh, for myself, if, if not. <laughs> we did get one question just now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read that and come on back afterwards, Logan. Um, so Dr. Thurber, this question asks, how does life around diffuse CH4 flux show differently than at sites with discrete CH4 seeps? Oh, so I love this question. Um, so there's many different habitats that are all part of a methane seep, and there's some that are really heavily bubbling, lots and lots of methane being released, and that impact creates this sort of real epicenter of activity, especially for microbes. The vast majority of methane seeps are not that. They are um, just very diffuse, slow flow of methane being released through the seafloor, and that leads to habitats like the microbial mats. You can also get lots of microbial mats at the the heavily flowing ones. And we do see that there's different microbial communities at those. A lot of that's been through global comparison, different taxa, especially of those that are responsible for eating methane are, are present at those different habitats. But again, we're still just scratching the surface on that. The other reason why I really love that question is that when we're looking for methane seeps, we look for bubbles. And the reason is, is because uh, colleagues can use uh, different sorts of sonar systems and multi-beam sonar to be able to identify those bubbles coming out of the seafloor, which tells us that there's a methane seep present. The challenge is, is that there's no good way via ship without actually getting down and looking to look for methane that's being slowly released from the seafloor. And so the reason why it's really important is when we talk about the 3,000 
methane seeps, bubble streams coming off the coast here, that's only the really, really active methane seeps or those that have bubbles that we can see where the vast majority or many of them don't. Others will have one, a bubble stream here and there, but won't have it constantly. So again, gross underestimate of the total amount of methane being released and fueling the coastal habitats. And also those seeps that don't have bubbles, there's no great way to actually identify where they are, uh, even as we start and we increasingly map the seafloor, uh, we won't be able to find the total distribution of that until we start literally going down and taking images of massive swaths of the seafloor. And it's a really exciting future direction. But yes, uh, diffuse versus active seepage absolutely changes the microbial and biological communities that are present there. Thank you. We just got another question. Uh, this next question asks, do you know how the chemosynthetic microbe species compare to those in some deep freshwater lakes, such as Lake Kivu, Rwanda, DRC? Are they similar? So uh, at a gross level, they are similar. Um, and as, and I don't have a great answer to that, other than at a very high level, there are similar taxa that are responsible for eating methane in um, both fresh as well as saltwater systems to a point. There are also taxa that are much more prevalent in freshwater systems than saltwater systems, uh, and then some that appear to co-occur in different ways. So um, the challenge is, is that question really requires specific uh, comparison, and that's comparison of at the genome level. Uh, and again, we're just getting to the point where we can really get complete genomes or near complete genomes, because most of these taxa we can't culture, we can't get pure cultures in the lab. And so we're having to heavily lay to rely and use this uh, bioinformatics revolution, the sequencing revolution to begin to get to the point where we can say how similar, how different are those taxa as we go freshwater, saltwater, estuarine, salt marsh, um, you name it. That's really just a, that's where a lot of the research is going to really disentangle that of the key taxa. Thank you. Thought Logan's gonna pop back on for the very last question of our event. Yep. So I ask this question a lot because we have a lot of interns kind of roaming the halls of NOAA right now, but um, can you just kind of briefly explain some key experiences that got you to where you are today and, and your background? Yeah. So. Uh, I'd like to say that I uh, just sort of followed interesting things that presented themselves, and I never ended. I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing, or what I am doing. Uh, I always wanted to study initially sharks and then fish, and then I got an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Craig Smith at University of Hawaii, and I spent three years staring through a microscope at worms, and I absolutely fell in love with worms. They're so diverse, so amazing. And then how they're interacting with microbes was this sort of, sort of the nexus of me trying to understand how ecosystems that are this microbial communities living with animal communities, how they work. And the more I look into it, you start understanding these bigger and bigger questions. And so I got the opportunity to start looking at polar systems uh, to understand that they're actually really part of a, the global world as well. And then methane seep systems and appreciate their role in ocean ecosystems, and then just continue this path to try to understand how they are increasingly used by society. And, and I'll also say that my PhD advisor was, is Dr. Lisa Levin, and she's giving the next one of these talks, so it should be great. Um, but she was instrumental in providing the tools, knowledge, and excitement to do the research that I'm fortunate and privileged enough to currently do.